Hey viewers, what's going on? My name is Devotable Halo HD. Today I am joined by Sergeant Rorschach. That is how you pronounce my name. Yeah. And if you guys don't understand it, we could also go with Rorschach. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. The so things we... people have called me. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so, so we're going to call you Rorschach, all right? Yeah. So how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. All right. Now, if you guys don't know, Sergeant Rorschach is from the clan NAPCOM. What position are you in? I'm the commanding officer of the Marines. So does that mean you're in charge of the Marines in total? Uh, yes. All right. So we're going to be asking you about your history and a few things about NAVCOM. So when did you first join the Halo Reach clan community? All right. I joined the clan community. Um, I don't remember the exact month or so, but I think it was around... I remember... It's really weird that I remember it by this, but it was around when Rise of the Spartans Part 4, Part 5 came out. Because... The lobby I was in, it was that one racetrack map, that zombie infection where it's like a circle and you just drive around. But I was hanging out with Mike WB and some some elite was running around like, oh, Mike, I'm your biggest fan or whatever. And I don't know, for some reason, he just stood out to me. So I talked to him about whatever. I sent him a friend request and uh, then he asked me to join his dumb elite group. And I said, well, okay, yeah, sure, definitely. Because I hadn't been in clans since, like, or any, I hadn't been in clans for a while. Um, so I joined his elite group, which was called the WOR. And that was, I think, like, late, or not WOR, WOS, the Warriors of St. Helios. And that was late 2011, I think, or summer 2011, something like that. Um, so I joined around there uh his group ended because it turns out the random that i met in this one lobby turned out to be as people know him today nikai vodaris uh who's some dumb imperial some dumb made up rank in the rsl right now um so after so during my time in the wos we uh we got invited to a raid or we didn't get invited to a raid. We got into a game, and some military groups surrounded us, and because I'm a negotiator, like, I I talk more than I shoot. Uh, I talked to the guys, we left the game, but it turned out that the people we joined their game was DOD, and I stayed because they knew who I was because of Rise of the Spartans, so I sent Simone and SOCOM a friend request, or I think they did, they sent me one. So after uh, the Warriors of St. Helios fell, I joined DOD. And I don't really remember much from DOD. I remember a bunch of 12-year-olds. I remember me being the only person that really led raids. So I would go into a game and there would be no cohesion. It would just be, I'm going to go on Alaska and I'll flank them with an assault rifle when they're over on like... <laughs> You know, like, something stupid like that. DoD was not the most organized group. The competitive team, the special operations, were pretty good, but every other branch was really basic. So, I joined them. I was in there for about four or five months. I was in the Navy, and I got up to Master Chief, Petty Officer. Then it became the Air Force, and I was whatever. But around that time was um, when Voltage got really big. And... So I talked to SOCOM about it, and it was sort of a sketchy thing that I did. I'll admit, I was basically double clanning, but the way I presented it to SOCOM was like, Voltage is this really big threat in the community. You should totally send me in there and allow me to be in their uniform so I can gather intelligence. Which is basically just me being like, so DOD is boring, I want to join Voltage, but I don't want to make my friends upset who I've made in DOD. So... I remember the exact day I joined Voltage, and it was really funny. I joined their military group, not their competitive group, because I'm a bad kid, obviously. Um, and speak of the devil, Bad Kid was there. And Bad Kid was like, oh, well, here are new recruits, whatever. And, oh, who are you? Oh, yeah, I'm Sergeant Rorschach. People say that we sound alike. Sergeant Rorschach? You mean the guy from uh, Rise of the Spartans? You know Arbiter 617? Yeah, I know Arbiter 617. All right, you get to be a second lieutenant in Voltage. Just straight off the bat, just, you know, you were in Rise of the Spartans? Here's a rank. Here, here's a good rank. So, um, 
I didn't really do much in Voltage. I have a film clip, a really old film clip, where we were in, like, some Voltage dungeon or whatever, and everything was, like, sort of underwater, and everyone was just assassinating each other. Um, but I still kept in contact with DOD, and I still helped them out from time to time. And the one thing that really got me interested in Navcom specifically was... I was talking to some DOD guys. I was in a raid, and I had to leave for whatever reason. Uh, it was like, I, I think I had to go eat dinner, something like that. So I come back, and the game was over. Oh, well, did you win? Because they had 12 guys in there, or 10 or 12 guys guarding the space that was on Montana. No, we uh, completely lost the base, and then the game ended. Well, how, do, how did you lose the base? You had 10 guys in there. Well, a Navcom Spartan 2 joined, and... One of our privates accidentally shot them, so they killed everyone and, pulled the, and held the base single-handedly. Which stupefied me, because it's like, ten guys versus one, that doesn't make sense. Even though it was DOD and they were pretty bad, and that's pretty much the only reason why probably they lost the base. If it was a reasonable group like SO, or if it was like Exodus now, it would just be, oh, the Spartan 2 is shooting at us now. And then they would just DMR him and it would be done. But it was DOD, so even though I wasn't really thinking about it at the time, it just stuck out to me, because I've... because at the time NAVCOM and NAVSPEC war weren't really a big thing in the community. I remember people talking on General JB's YouTube channel, and they would talk about the two communities. The military community and the St. Healy community. The UNSC community wasn't even a thing yet. No one acknowledged it, it was really small. Pretty much the only groups around then were NAVSPEC War from like 2010 to 2011. The little groups that uh, formed together to make NAVSPEC War at the start of Reach. And then after NAVSPEC War had, er, fell apart and came back up and became NAVCOM, that's re those were really the only true uh, UNSC groups. They're not true UNSC groups. I don't want to sound pretentious and like, yeah, they're the only ones. And everyone else was fake. But, like, they were the only big and notable groups at the time. So, at the roughly at the same time, uh, Dunbar, who was Navcom John from... So, Navcom John 117 from, like, when Navcom was formed to 2013, when NavSpec were split off and all the Spartan 2s left. Um, he made a YouTube video saying, Come, apply to be a Spartan 2, whatever. So I did, because it was interesting. So Voltage had already collapsed. DOD had pretty much collapsed at that time. Or I don't think they collapsed necessarily. They had just gotten really inactive and sort of smaller. Um, and this was around... I joined NAVCOM for the first time in May of 2012. And so I joined straight as a conscript to the Spartan 2s. Which is funny, because the Spartan 2s back then were pretty garbage, and saying that now is in completely different light, but they, the guy that was running it, because NavSpec War 2s were weird in their customs, so they had a non-canon Spartan 2, Paul 120 SII, or 129 SII, uh, as one of the main drill instructors, and his training was phase one, you do campaign, uh, legendary, all skulls on. And then phase two was something else. But I didn't get to phase two because after I had done legendary all skulls on, because it was easy, that's very simple. I just did it with a couple friends. Um, they said, oh, well, Paul's an idiot. So none of the conscripts are getting through. So after that, I joined the Spartan 3s, which were also garbage at the time. All you had to... I don't even think there was conscription back in May of 2012 for the Spartan 3s in Navcom. You literally... I still have the map. You literally just played matchmaking... Or not matchmaking. You played firefight. They had a firefight game type that was like... The first two sets or whatever were really easy, and then the last one was like... 2,000% shielding, headshots disabled, and it was impossible, so you couldn't do it. So it didn't even matter how far along you got in it, it's just like the Spartan 2 that was in charge, NavSpec War Kurt, 
who is the OG Kurt of the community, which is funny because I've heard tons of things from people like, yeah, Navspec War Kurt, or the OG Kurt. He was like, he was some guy, he's, uh, he's in the military right now. He's some super hardcore Marine. He's like a Marine sergeant or something. In Navcom in 2012, he was a high school kid that like picked shotgun and armor lock and matchmaking, went bottom of the leaderboard and rage quit. He's probably some college kid right now. We're a dropout, so it's just really funny to hear everyone brag about uh, some guy's supposed history when he wasn't anything special to begin with. But so I joined the Spartan Freeze, and I was pretty much unsatisfied with how the Spartan Freeze were going because we had about fifteen or so guys, and. It, it, it was simple. It was like a secondary Marine Corps, except we were Spartans or whatever. I remember being in a raid where there was like some OD... We were getting like spawn killed by Banshees or whatever, and we were hiding on the shore of the island, and someone said, don't worry guys, a Spartan's coming, and all the ODST saw it's like, oh, thank God, a Spartan. And then a Spartan 3 comes, and they're like, oh my God, a Spartan 3. I thought it was a 2. You know, they were pretty much... They were worse than the Marine, uh, than the Marines and the ODSTs at the time. So, so I was pretty unsatisfied with it. So I talked to another Spartan two of nav spec war, or he was in Navcom now, James 005 SII or Willie Cypress now, because he's retired from the community. Um, and he had experience as a Spartan three in another group that he made, which merged into nav spec war in 2010 or 2011. And I convinced him, after talking to him for a while, that he should replace Kurt. And that didn't happen because the Navspec War 2s are sort of favoritist a little. So they didn't want to flat out remove Kurt from his commanding officer position, even though Kurt didn't do, Kurt didn't do anything. So they just put uh, James as senior chief petty officer and lead drill instructor. And that was really the first like contemporary s3 group so now there's like a bunch of spartan threes running around with the uh with the base security shoulders the pilot helmet whatever and the all of armor that started in navcom in 2012 before that before that there weren't many spartan twos but there were no spartan threes and when there were they wore like eva actually they had the option of wearing eva security or pilot and they wore it with ODST shoulders. So that was the first really contemporary group. And that was the first sort of people that uh, started changing their gamer tag to like Cody A042, who was in my class with me. Or um, who's another good example? Kirk A226, who was, uh, who was an ODST and Navcom before that. Um, Jeff a167 just to throw names out there so that was the first group that really did that um and we were tr i looked over the notes uh, a couple months ago and it was surprising because it seemed longer but we were only trained for a month and we were trained with the purpose they had kicked out a lot of the spartan freeze from before from before james took over and we started with a fresh batch so myself and two other people that were in the previous threes got there and nine other people were new. So we were given the purpose of getting trained and then fighting the some covenant, the covenant that the Singhili community was making, which would later become the covenant that the Blades of Transcendence fleet, the BTF and the Singhili Eminence made with uh, Ratak, Rizami and all of them. So we, uh, we were trained for a month and then I was, and then on my birthday, funny enough, on my birthday, after we had gotten graduated, uh, one of the drill instructors, I put on the map High Charity, which everyone has High Charity now, but in 2012, it was sort of a map that not many people had because it had only been made recently in late 2011 or early 2012. So it wasn't really a map that was highly distributed. I had gotten it somehow. I probably raided someone and got kicked immediately, but still saved the map. And a drill instructor yelled at me or whatever. And then UUF joined. And the funny thing about it is Zektorn, uh, another guy who I don't remember, and the other guy's guest joined. And so we were, 
on we were sort of tense with one another because UUF I forget why I don't know UUF and us this was before the NAVCOM UUF war of 2012 so we didn't really have any reason to be tense with one another but we just were so the guest starts shooting everywhere and starts killing people but it's a guest obviously so I'm telling everyone just ignore the person it's a guest who cares the drill instructor starts yelling at me i start defending the uf guys uh and then the drill instructor uh complains to james the senior chief the senior chief consults all his other guys so i got removed from the spartan threes and put into the marines and i was basically third in command of the marines funny enough zektorn later after I had defending, defended him in that game, joined the next class of Spartan 3s, and was pretty much one of the best people in that class, and flat out said that if I hadn't done that, uh, he probably wouldn't have joined NAVCOM because of our reputation, which was pretty shit even back then. So it's not like anything has changed. Um, so I joined the Marines for a long time. Uh, for a while, I was in the Marines. I joined... September 4th, my birthday, uh, and then I I was under the command of my good friend who I, I'd known him since like 2007 or so, and I'm the one that recruited him into NAVCOM. His gamer tag was Sergeant Harvac, not to be confused with the other Harvac, but it's spelled the same way, just without the second K, so H-A-R-V-A-C-K, Sergeant Harvac. Um, so... I was under his command for a while, and the Marines were pretty inactive. They were big, but they were sort of inactive and reclusive, so people in NAVCOM joked that I was the only Marine in NAVCOM because I was the only per person from the Marine Corps that they would actually see. Uh, then the Spartan 4s started up, and the 3s got ridiculously big, and right at the end of the first NAVCOM generation, um, so from when it started up in like April or May to February of 2013, we had like 30 Marines, like 20 ODSTs, and then we had 36 S3s, like 25 Spartan 4s, and like 15 S2s, or 10 to 15 S2s, and then like five Navy. So the Spartans outweighed the, not the like Marines and ODSTs. So it was getting a bit ridiculous here. This, I remember the Spartan 4 training was actually easier than the ODST training that they had to go through. It was like a three-day process. You could become a Spartan Four in three days. And it took like five days to become an ODST. It was ridiculous. So a bunch of drama happened. The Spartan Twos didn't like how they were being treated, even though... Or they were being disrespected, sort of, by the Spartan Fours, even though that the Spartan Twos were only good at raids and they weren't really proficient in other forms of combat, so 8v8s or anything like that. The, the Spartan 2s of uh, Nazpec War actually, actually always talked about how if you burst fire an assault rifle, it can be just as good as a DMR. There's no reason to use a DMR. So you can see exactly why people were unsatisfied with the, uh, with the proficiency of the Spartan 2s. So the Spartan 2s didn't like that they were being disrespected. The Spartan 4s and the Spartan... No, the Spartan 3s were on the Spartan 2 side, but the Spartan 4s didn't like that the Spartan 2s were held in such a high regard, even though they weren't good. Uh, the Marines and the ODSTs just sort of tried to stay out of it because it was just Spartan drama. But then Navspec War leaves in 2012, or 2013, in February of 2013. The Spartan 3s go with them, and the Spartan 3 brand. No. Actually, a few threes stayed, like two threes, and pretty much all the Spartans, aside from the fours, go to Navspec War to make the new iteration of Navspec War, which is still up to date, but is incredibly inactive. So, instead of going to stay with Navcom, which is what some people in the threes did, because I had been uh, reaccepted back into the threes after everyone... I forget why it was accepted back into the threes. They realized that it was a stupid mistake to kick me out uh, a week after it happened. I got a message. I still have the message saying that, but 
I don't know, it took me a while to get back into the 3s. But instead of me staying in NAVCOM or going to NAVSPEC War like a bunch of them, I decided to go to the BTF because it was a new group that was starting up. And uh, I, had, I was interested in it. So that was the, that's pretty much my first time in NAVCOM. Do you have any questions about that? About that first chapter of my history? I know I've blabbed on for like 20 minutes at this point. Sorry. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, viewers. I'm very interesting, you know, as you can see. I have a few questions about what goes on in NAVCOM. So, who basically is in charge of NAVCOM, like the whole clan in total? Is there anyone really in charge? Because I believe the clan is a republic. Uh, we, have, we are led by a HICOM, and our HICOM is run in a way that is sort of... It's a little bit weird, so... The HICOM is typically run by the commanding officers of the four branches, so the Marines, the ODSTs, the Navy, and the Spartan Twos, and then the staff that that individual branch has. So I have two executive officers and an operations officer. So, so the Marines have four representatives in, that, in HICOM. The ODSTs have a... What do they have? Let me look this up. They have their commanding officer, their executive officer, their operations officer, and then they have a fourth in command. So they have four representatives. And likewise, with me, the Navy has a commanding officer, two executive officers, an operations officer, yada, yada, yada for the twos. Um, the way HICOM works is we have, we just talk, but the commanding officers are given not necessarily a majority vote, but the executive officers have like less of a vote than the commanding officers, and the operation officers and fourth in commands don't have any vote at all. They're just allowed to speak their opinion and represent you know, the ideas that they want to represent, which is enough power, which is you know, a decent amount of power. The ability to freely express your ideas in what you think is right is pretty convincing. So... And then we have a general commanding officer. And the misconception is that the general commanding officer is the leader of the group. But the Marines and the ODST, everyone operates autonomously. Like the, command, uh, the general commanding officer, Javier, or, Fred, or NAVCOM Fred, hasn't like ordered any commanding officer, period. He doesn't do that. The position he holds is that seeing as how he was in NAVSPEC war before the NAVCOM merge. So he's, if you consider NAVSPEC war uh, service a uh, direct part of NAVCOM service, because NAVSPEC war merged into, like, and became NAVCOM, Javier has probably been in the group for four or five years. So he uh, has obvious seniority and knowledge. So while Javier has a majority vote, and I think it takes two or three commanding officers alone, so excluding the votes of the executive officers to overthrow him, Javier knows not to, like, mess with any... Like, he doesn't abuse his power. He has a great amount of power, but he's been in the community long enough to know what his role is, and his role is just to... If something ridiculous goes down, so... What is it? Like, if... Military groups call it, like, code red, you know, like, on their websites. It's like, we're in status green or status red or whatever. So, like, if, if things get to, like, code orange or code red, then that's when he sort of steps in and is like, all right, here's a solution. And that typically only happens when individual branches have, uh, you know, when things are divided 50-50. And that's pretty much the way to look at his role as general commanding officer. When... Because we have four branches, we have multiple executive officers. If things are drawn 50-50 down the line, then Javier is the tiebreaker. He comes up with the conclusions. And everyone respects, and everyone in Avcom respects his authority, respects his opinions, and we acknowledge that he has been here for a long time. So we listen to him, and he makes good calls. So that's the structure of Navcom. All right. So... Who is currently leading the NAVCOM Spartan 2s? Uh, that would be Petty Officer 2nd Joshua SO29II, or Sweaty Mike. Now, do these basically Spartan 2s operate like, by themselves from like their Spartan leader, or how does it work? Spartan 2s, um, they aren't really... To join the Spartan 2s, or well, no, you don't join. You're chosen to join the Spartan 2s. 
you don't really need to be led. If you're chosen to be a Spartan 2, you can act autonomously. So what Spartan 2s mostly do is if they have a decision that they need to make, so, hey, someone left and wants to join back or whatever. So, like, say someone leave. Yeah, it happened very recently. Uh, someone, like, had to sell their Xbox or whatever and had to resign from Navcom, um, and they had enough money to get their Xbox back. So the Spartan 2s just talk to each other in their kick and they decided by majority vote if they wanted them back and the guy's back but as far as like combat efficiency or combat operating in combat all they really do is just if the marines or odsts are hosting a raid or whatever and there's a spot open a spartan 2 just joins and he reports to the person in charge of the raid and if there's no one suitable to lead the raid, so if there isn't a corporal or a sergeant or anything higher than that, then the Spartan 2 just takes charge. Alright. So, recently during this time, there is a war, I believe, and a lot of UNSC clans have uh, united. What was this alliance called? Do you know? The Soul Defense Administration. Alright. Uh, who? What clan is really in charge of this alliance? We don't have a leader. Um, we wanted everything to be sort of equal, so we just talk to one another and we figure out what everyone thinks is best. But we really just wanted to make sure that there wasn't one individual group calling all the shots. And I especially didn't want that to be NAVCOM, because you could imagine, look at this, NAVCOM's making a coalition of smaller UNSC groups and he's, they're just taking over them. It's, it's mind-washing, they're just power-hungry. Like, all the stupid stuff that would be said on the Facebook group. So, we wanted everything to be fair and equal, and we definitely wanted to avoid any of that nonsense. Alright. Now, is there a single person who is the founder of NAVCOM? Uh, as far as a single person, that would, I guess that would just be Dunbar, because the way NAVSpec War ended in 2012 was that a bunch of, like how NAVCOM was formed, a bunch of smaller UNSC groups in 2010 uh, met each other through the file browser or whatever, and they decided, hey, let's just make a big group. So Dunbar, John Lennon 7, decided he didn't like how NAVSpec War was running things because they were pretty much ran by Joshua 029, um, and Dunbar and, John have, or, and Joshua have always had differences. So John made... Navcom and left, and the Navspec War decided to merge into Navcom. So, I guess technically Dunbar would be the founder, but he hasn't been in the community since like 2013. He's currently in the army as a reservist or something. Alright. So, basically, I've been hearing a lot of talk, and a lot of the talk is that about Navspec War, on how when Navspec War goes into multiplayer matchmaking, they're always met by Navcom people, and basically Navcom people are, like, forcing Navspec War offline most of the time due to the fact that they're, like, let's just say, uh, killing them or something like that during the matchmaking game. It is, okay. I would say that absolutely 100% of that is true. But that's mostly because Navspec War has this attitude of we were the first big UNSC group or, you know, like, we're the oldest, we know what's up, we're, our Spartan 2s are the best and most disciplined. And then our Spartan 2s are like, alrighty then, let's play Team Slayer. And then we win, like, 50 to 14. So, it... While it's mostly just against the Navspec War Spartan 2s, I've had several friends that were in Navspec War for a long duration of time, and if you don't know, Navspec War Marine training, it takes three months, three or four months. Actually, no, it's four months, and if you leave and join back, you have to go through an additional month of training. So that's four or five months just to become a Marine. And I've had plenty of friends who go through the whole thing, and then after they go through all this training, Navspec War does nothing. Navspec War primar Marines primarily do uh, Living Dead, fun custom games like Infection with one another, and maybe, once in a blue moon, a raid against some bad organization, which they lose at. So, it's not so much a matter of Navcom going out of our way to bully that. I guess in a light it could be seen as that. But it's most, more so that Navspec War has this attitude of 
we were the first, therefore we are the best. So, you know, it's just some group going and acting like they're the shit when they're not. Every, I, I think it's been done a thousand times in the community where some group acts like they're the best thing. And then, you know, some big group like SOH or HICOM or RSL or whatever, you know, like some big intimidating group goes out of their way to just, you know, beat some sense into them and say, no, you're not. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to talk about another topic, and this is primarily going to involve, like, basically the UNSC and saying Healy relationships. Now, I basically believe that originally saying Healy was meant to fight UNSC and that's how the clan things went and later on like I believe you guys started fighting like military clans which you guys call insurrectionists because they're not UNSC themselves right but Nav Navcom doesn't do that Nav we call military groups military groups we don't really make a policy of calling uh, people insurrectionist groups unless they identify as insurrectionists so really the only insurrectionist group is Exodus but wasn't, like, originally, like, the fight supposed to be, like, uh, UNSC versus Sang Healy? But, like, now, like, I see, like, a lot of, like, UNSC clans getting into conflict with each other. Um, back in 2010 and 2011, definitely uh, the early groups of the UNSC fought each other and fought military groups. There's this notion in the modern community that uh, UNSC groups are... You know, we're a brotherhood, we're not supposed to shoot each other, but that just falls under poor co uh, community ideologies. Like the people that are like, oh, we need to have peace with one another, there's no fighting. But if there's no fighting, there's no activity, if there's no activity, the clan community dies. So, I've definitely, from personal experience for being an AVCOM, I've definitely been in games where we shoot someone and we you know have a raid or whatever and then a week later it's like navcom declared war on this group right well no we never did that we don't declare war on people where did you hear that oh well you shot this group in a raid so we instantaneously assumed that it was some political like convoluted nonsense and that there's this big war that's about to brew really there's conflict that's just, you know, like, what's going on with Exodus and Navcom right now, which is, like, uh, declared, both sides agree, all right, we're going to fight each other, this is going to be over something. You know, like, there's a reason behind this. And then there's just joining a raid to, like, be in a raid and have fun. Because I, I, a lot of people in the community really don't understand. It's, like, everyone expects like oh well you're joining a raid and you're shooting at us therefore there is some sort of deep-rooted reason behind this there is some sort of complex like you have thought about this for hours you sat down at a war council and you're like this raid we're gonna go here we're gonna shoot these people no we're just joining a video game session to shoot at people and have fun people put way too much thought into things that should be pretty much thoughtless it it's like it's like someone sniping you in matchmaking and getting personally offended by it and sending them a message. It's just, you know, it's nonsense. So no, groups back in the early UNSC community definitely fought each other and they definitely, you know, they had skirmishes, but some of it was some of it was heated art over like heated arguments and it actually became like a conflict. And some of it was just like, We have guys, you have guys, let's shoot each other. Okay. That's pretty much it. All right. So as for, like, the thing where people say, like, usually the main thing, like, UNSC's went for was saying Healy, was that true or not? Um, early, early in the community, I would say that the primary focus was uh, against St. Healy community. But that's mostly because the St. Healy community, out of all three communities, or however many, now that there's, like, you know, war... Uh, what is it? Warhammer 40k clans and stuff like that and Star Wars groups. But whatever, just consisting of the Singhili community, the military community, and the UNSC community, the Singhili community is pretty much the oldest. I think everyone can agree that the military community had has its roots in late Halo 3, early Halo Reach with like with U or with the UUC, you know, uh, Chris's group and uh 
the UN and all those groups that were around back then. And that the UNSC community was sort of formed around, uh, you know, around the same time frame, 2011, 2010, with NAVSPEC war and all those. But from what I've seen from, you know, looking stuff up, going through people's, like, halo.bungie.net files and, like, checking their screenshots and stuff, that the Singhili community has deep-rooted history, like, back spanning, like, 2007, 2008, the, one of the pioneer groups, so basically the UN, or the NAVSPEC, or the Sangheili community, the Sovereign Guard, uh, if you look up their leader, Urdu Kaloli's, like, history, you can see, like, his clan form and, like, interact with other Sangheili groups if you go back to his Halo 2 files in 2005. And by the way, the Sovereign Guard is still operational, so it's a clan that's 10 years running. So the Sangheili community was this big, massive thing, and the UNSC community was obviously not organized. It was hardly a community at that point in Halo 3. Because, you know, a community is a grouping together of multiple bodies. You can't be a community with one thing. So, individual Spartan groups would meet, you know, the Sovereign Guard, or the Crusading Spirit Fleet, or whatever big Sangheili group in Halo 3, and they would get spawn-killed by them, because that's what the Sangheili back then did. I've talked to, you know, people from the old Sangheili community, and they figure, you know, fighting humans, like, they're inferior, they're inherently inferior, so not like, not like how it is in the story, not like, oh, they must be destroyed, we must kill all of them, it's like, why waste your time with them? Sangheili fight Sangheili. It's the only test of actual strength and competence. So, and that's the first raids that I know, that I've seen, um, as going back into community history, starting off with the Singhili community, where the Singhili would get bored, you know, they would have no one to 8v8, matchmaking would get tiresome after 20 games in a row, so they'd be like, alright, let's make a base, and let's invite whatever random military or UNSC group here, and just spawn kill them. So, that's really where the UNSC aggression in the community started towards Singhili, which is, you know, the pioneers of the UNSC military groups, getting spawn killed by big, intimidating Sangheili organizations on, like, Sandtrap, where they have, you know, like, this big column where you can't, where, like, after five minutes, the gate, like, a gate you can't walk through spawns in, so it's an impenetrable fortress, and they just spawn kill you with, like, beam rifles and carbines and banshees and stuff, and you spawn with a pistol or something, you know. So that's where the deep-rooted hatred for Singheili really starts. But recently, as everyone's aware, the Singheili community has sort of died out, and there aren't really any re there aren't really any respectful groups, let alone like military. Mer uh, sorry, talking for so long has my mouth dry. Militarily competent groups left. So that's why uh, that's how Singheili aggression started, and that's why. It's coming to a close now. All right. So I'm going to ask you this question quickly. Uh, why are, or when did you, like, like, how did you become, like, the rank in NAVCOM you are now? Like, I know you went through a long history, but I believe you got up to the S3s, and that was where it kind of went. Yeah. So I joined, I joined as a conscript for the Spartan 2s. I, you know, as I said, I went to the 3s. The base rank for the threes was crewman, so E3, the equivalent of Lance Corporal. I didn't move up from there, even though I was, like, the chief advisor to the commanding officer, and I pretty much... There were a few months there where I basically, the executive officer of the branch would be like, I want to do this, and I'd join his party and say, no, that's a bad idea. And he's like, okay, it's a bad idea. So, I was a crewman, and then I joined the Marines, um... And I got up to first sergeant, and I was unofficially the third in command, but I was the third highest rank, so. Um, then I rejoined NAVCOM in May of 2014, and I joined the Marines. I worked up to the rank of sergeant. Then the commanding officer of the Marines left to join the ODSTs, and he appointed me as this position. And since... What is it? I became command commanding officer in late or early July. I can't remember. I've just worked up on to the position I'm at right now of first lieutenant. All right. So 
these conflicts against Exodus, do you know why it was really started? Oh, absolutely. I'm the one that... I'm Gilmo and I are the one that came up with the idea for uh, the Soul Defense Administration, and we're the ones that decided to fight against Exodus. It's purely for activity, entirely so. The community has been in a downward spiral since the way I presented it to the other UNSC groups was pretty much since the last iteration of DGA ended. Like, DGA was this big group, and everyone had beef with them, so there was this big conflict. And then as soon as DGA ended, there was no public enemy. There was, like, Marshock, but Marshock didn't have any members, because who would join Marshock? So, you know, the, the community... Nothing big happened in the community in 2014, period. There were minor conflicts between NAVCOM and HICOM, but can you honestly think of a big conflict that happened in 2014 that matches, like, you know, the, U the wars against the UN or, you know, DOD fighting Central Command in 2012, Clan War Three? Nothing big happened in 2012, or 2014, I mean. So that's what Gilmo and I wanted to do. We wanted, because NAVCOM could definitely take Exodus on by ourselves and Exodus and the other members of the coalition understand, like, yeah, but we want... We want other parts of the community. We don't want this battle to just be between Exodus and Navcom because then other members of the community can't get on it. So we brought together a bunch of relatively sized uh, UNSC groups that were relatively skilled or disciplined, and we decided, all right, let's make a big community announcement about this. And as you can see, you know, Navcom and some other groups coming to fight Exodus in this big coalition. Like, it's the perfect thing for drawing activity and creating drama in the community. So no, entirely, the entire reason, 100%, that this whole conflict started with Exodus is for activity for the whole community and just to breathe live that life back into everything. Because, you know, 2014 happened. So let's make 2015 better. Alright. So, why do you believe, like, the community has went downhill since 2012? Uh, it's a, it's very simple. The way the community, or the way the game works is people play the game. So let's say 100% of the people play the game, obviously. Now let's say, you know, 10% of that 100% are into clans. And then 1% of that 10% are like your, you know, are your general JBs or your SOCOMs or your lag links, you know, big community figures. As the 100%, so like as the total population of the people playing the game dwindles, so does the 10% and the 1%. So the fact that Halo isn't a popular franchise anymore, and the fact that we're on Halo Reach, an old-ass game, directly affects the clan community. If the clan community wants to get big and active again, like, I hate to break it to everyone, but the only way we could do that is if we, like, coordinated something between the Singhui community, the UNSC community, and, like, the military community. And we're like, all right, here's what we all agreed to be good for, like, Halo. Here's what we want Halo 5 or Halo 6 to be. Let's make a thread about it on Halo Waypoint. And then we all, like, you know, we make a poll on Halo Waypoint. And then, like, 20,000 people hit the yes button because we've coordinated that. And it's pretty much... That's like an exaggerated way of saying it, but literally, the only way to fix the Halo clan community is to fix Halo. And the, the way to fix Halo is to change 343's mind. So, if we want the community to work, if we want the community to be as alive as it was in 2012 or 2011, we literally just gotta convince 343 to make the changes that they need to make. Now, do you believe, like, a lot of this, like, uh, like, the way the community is small now is because a lot of people are scaled upon, like, different games, such as there's still a Halo 4 community and somewhat of a Halo MCC community. I would definitely... It's a no-brainer that, yes, absolutely, people being on different games and not interacting with one another makes the community stagnated. I mean... I know this will probably offend people, but if you're on Halo 4 on Xbox 360... What the fuck is wrong with you? A, Halo 4 is a bad game. B, MCC exists and the patch works now. Literally, I mean, just... The clan community needs to agree on what is... The perfect thing would just be if Halo Reach got an MCC. Then everything would be fine. We could just go to the same console. And then all the people that can't afford an Xbox One, I guess, are left behind. Which would suck. 
Navcom went through that where we kicked out all the people that didn't have 360s after we made the move to MCC. And it was a tough process, but we did it. It was manageable. No drama came of it. But yeah, the community being separated and very politi differently politically minded is one of the things that's contributing to the stagnation of the community. And there's, there's a difference between political di being different politically minded so you know you know you can have the ideology of oh i want to be a military group and i want to run it like this or i want to be a unsc group and i want to run it like this and that's fine you can be different minded there but when your differences start to directly impact your ability to combat other groups so i won't fight unsc groups because you know they're unsc and i'm unsc so that means that we're a brotherhood and we can't even like schedule a friendly practice raid or something as inane as that, which I've been told before. Then what happens is smaller groups who aren't getting exposure to larger conflicts dwindle out and then the individual members of the smaller groups are like, nothing happens in here. So they leave the clan community. The way to get people to stay in the clan community is to get them active. And the way to get them active is through conflict. And people hear conflict and they think big drama fest, everyone's arguing and screaming at each other. But conflict literally just means two opposing forces in a game shooting at each other. You can say, you know, good game at the end. You know, you can compliment each other. And that's still activity. So, that's pretty much my stance on that. Alright, now, <clears throat> I've seen this a couple of times aware, and... Basically, you guys moved back from Halo MCC, right? Because of, uh, like, the no-joining game process thing. Right? Yes. Uh, recently, 343 Industries, or, yeah, I think them for sure, they released an update, and this update apparently fixed a lot of, like, the matchmaking, like, problems of, like, joining a game, and it also fixed uh, the in joining game uh, process. And I think this is... I think you just only found out by me, right? Uh, I found out before, but... Um... We're definitely going to be testing things out. We're going to definitely test to see if MCC is still viable because we host all our competitive matches on MCC, which is the reason why we don't have any competitive matches because everyone that shit talks Navcom are Reach kids who don't want to play Halo C or Halo 2 uh, Anniversary or Halo 2 Classic. So we host we already have a policy of hosting all official competitive matches on MCC but uh, right now we haven't had a high com meeting about it but i'm definitely going to try and organize some sort of internal practice raid with us on MCC to see how things function and how things work out and if things work fine then we're going to probably start moving away from uh, halo reach and move towards MCC but only when not only but only when the community starts slightly moving towards MCC. So when the community... Because there's no point to moving to a game that no one's on. So when the community becomes more accepting of MCC and realizes that it's a more viable game to be on, then we'll start making radical changes and start leaving Reach and go to, going to MCC. Alright. So, I'm going to ask you my last question now. Is there anything else you'd like to cover before I ask? Um... I mean, there's a lot I can talk about. I know a lot about the uh, origins of the UNSC community because I went community. Wow, I really can't talk right now. Good job, me. There's probably going to be 20 comments about that uh, because I went out of my way to meet the, the founders of the community. I know a bunch of stuff about the origins of the Singhealy community. Um, so really, there's a lot I could talk about, but I'll... You know, I'll spare the viewers time because this is already reaching about an hour. So this is getting a little ridiculous. Um, but no, uh, all I'd really like to say is that I have the names of some of the older people from the UNSC community and the Singhealy community. So if anyone is interested in learning more about either one of those, organi you know, either one of those communities, just message me. I'm always willing to talk about history. All right. So my last question is, how do you believe you can help like grow the Halo Clan community to the way it used to be, or somewhat of like a higher power, or the Halo Reach Halo community? Sorry. 
I would definitely just say what I said before about the 343 thing. If we want change to be in the community and we want communi the community to grow and expand again, then the thing we have to do is we have to make Halo a popular and desirable game to play. And if we make Halo a desirable game to play and the clan community is on the latest iteration of the game because no one's going to play an old game, then we have to make sure that the population size is large. It's, I mean, it's just simple math, really, when you think about it. If the game is big, then the population, or if the game is successful and good, then the population size is big. And if the population size is big, then that means statistically that's a higher chance of people being interested in clans, meaning there's more people joining the clan community, meaning there's more smart people joining the clan community. All right, I believe that is it. Uh, I'd like to thank you coming for being on this interview, Sergeant Rorschach. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be up on a interview series alongside General JB and uh, Shadow Sniper and all those large community uh, names when I haven't when I really haven't done that much. So thank you very much for the honor. <laughs> no problem. Anyways, guys, if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button. If you guys have anything that you want to say, I'm pretty sure Sergeant Rorschach will answer any questions on this video. Mm -hmm. uh, just leave your comment down in the description below. Anyways, guys, that is it for this video, and we'll probably be seeing more from Sergeant Rorschach, considering he has some origin stories. So, yeah, I'll talk to you guys all later. Bye.